Okay, continuing on with uh, chapter eight. So here's um, this slide here, which is from page 181 of your textbook, uh, is a really good demonstration of some of what we're gonna be looking at and some of the phenomena we're gonna be studying. So consider this situation on, up on the top here. So Jeremy walks past Maria. Maria's eyes are stationary. So Maria's just kind of looking straight at say the window and Jeremy walks by, okay? Um, she detects motion. She detects motion uh, because there's a there's a disturb there's a disturbance in in her optic array, All right? So she detects motion due to that disturbance in her optic array. Now consider the following um, uh, situation here. Jeremy walks past Maria. Maria follows him with her eyes. Now once again. Uh, so it's almost the same as this one, except that you know Maria catches sight of Jeremy and then she watches, so she follows him with her eyes. Notice how the the whole scene is is moving. Now it seems like it's a minor difference. It's like you know what what's the big deal here, right? But this is actually very different because from a from a um, sensation and perspective, uh, sensation and perception perspective, and from a physiological perspective. Notice that here where um, uh, Maria is following uh, Jeremy with her eyes, notice that Jeremy stays on the same spot on her retina the whole time, all right? So it, 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 the retina is capturing this image and it's staying right there on the retina as she follows. Whereas here on the top, the image of Jeremy is actually going across the retina. However, in spite of this difference, there is movement detected in both situations. Now notice this one here. There's nothing there, but she's sweeping her eyes across um, the, 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 uh, the scene. So the optic flow is moving across the retina. The optic flow is moving across the retina as she, uh, in this example, uh, looks from left to right. So she looks from left to right and the, the optic flow is moving across the retina. So there's something moving across the retina just like there was here. Um, but, but there is no movement detected. There's no movement detected. So there's no movement detected here and there's movement detected in these two things here. So what are the mechanisms by which we're able to extract movement information from these images that are um, being projected across our retinas? All right, that's, those are the fundamental problems of um, when we're trying to figure out the wiring involved in our um, uh, in our in our uh, capabilities for detecting movement. Uh, so you know, here's a, uh, this table is on page 181 of your book, and it summarizes what I just talked about. So there's movement perceived in these top two situations here: uh, objects moving, sta eye stationary versus moving, the image on the retina moving versus stationary but yet there's not any movement detected on the third situation where there is um, an image on the retina moving and the eyes are moving, but there's an object that's not moving. Okay, so once again we go to Gibson. Gibson's uh, ecological approach to uh, um, uh, understanding perception, right? Um, and basically, according to Gibson, all of the information that we need uh, is available in the environment. So according to Gibson, the environment provides all of the cues, the context that is necessary for us to be able to dis decode and perceive uh, things like movement. We talked about this concept earlier, the, uh, the optic array. The optic array is the, the um, uh, 
what you're viewing in uh, in your field of vision and it's the it's the the structure the thing that's painted and displayed <clears throat> of all the surfaces textures contours uh, that are displayed for you or that are presented or present for you I should say as you're perceiving a scene right. so that's the optic array and of course the optic array changes second by second as you're as you're uh, navigating through an environment one of the fundamental ways that we detect movement is by a local disturbance in the optic array so um, so essentially what you have if you have an optic array that has a lot of stationary objects in it and then there one of those objects is moving relative to the other objects in the optic array we have we have our perceptual ability to detect that movement and uh, in Gibson's language that's known as a local disturbance in this in this array the global optic flow is the overall movement of the array so it's how the and and we typically um, interpret global optic flow as the movement of the environment as the uh, as the uh, observer is moving so as you move to the environment you have the optic flow of how things are changing around you second by second as you move to the environment um, of course you can <laughs> mess that up as if you've ever been drunk and had the bed spins you know lying in bed and the bed seems to be spinning and the room spinning uh, that's one way that you can disconnect your optic flow from your actual movements um, here uh, is the uh, right Reichart uh, came up with this theoretical concept of how neurons can be wired together to detect motion and the illustration here from your book on page 182 um, is a is a little summary of how these detectors work um, and basically this this circuit um, this detector circuit is designed to look for is designed to respond I should say dis respond to movements of local disturbances that are going from here to here not from this side to this side but rather from this side to this side so essentially the way it works is um, let's look at uh, figure A right so uh, the detector first picks up the first neuron in the detector neuron A is stimulated now neuron A fires and it stimulates neuron E neuron E fires and it stimulates neuron F now neuron F is an inhibitory neuron indicated by this orange color here so since it's inhibitory it's gonna tell neuron I the output neuron not to fire as the object continues to move it goes on and it lights up um, neuron B but B is connected to a via is relays to this again to this inhibitory neuron so it stimulates this inhibitory neuron to not fire so as we continue on we go and and uh, keep on um, lighting up these neurons that are not firing so this circuit is saying I not detect th this circuit is basically not going to activate for this movement going from this direction to this direction however if we take this very same circuit and then uh, operate it the opposite direction we'll see that of course the first neuron that gets activated in this circuit is neuron D it activates neuron H and it's not being inhibited by anything so neuron H fires and stimulates the output neuron neuron I to signal ultimately that a motion has occurred uh, the motion continues on to neuron uh, G which stimulates uh, this neuron here um, which is an inhibitory neuron now the inhibitory neuron is going to reduce the firing of neuron H uh, a little bit so it'll it will reduce the firing a bit which is telling the system that the movement has happened that it, the shift has happened from this spot right here to this spot right here uh, notice as the object continues to move it'll then stimulate neuron B which uh, will 
uh, which will then fire and increase the signal again and then stimulate this one which will uh, weaken the signal a little bit so you've got this pattern of responding that uh, flows along with the movement of the object as soon as the object goes away the neurons quit lighting up and so you're able to track with neurons the movement of this object across uh, these different circuits so what role does one of the things you have to look at when you're trying to understand um, motion perception is the relative role of the retina, the flow of information on the retina, and the movement of the eye. It seems to be, like if, if you go back here, right, if you go back to this problem here, right, where we are detecting movement here, detecting movement here, and not detecting any movement here, it seems to be that one of the reasons that we are able to detect movement in, one, in, in the, the two top scenes and not in the bottom scene is because of the movement of the eye. It turns out that we may use our eye movements as a cue that there's something moving in our, uh, there's a local disturbance in our optic array. One of the theories that's been put forth to describe this relationship between the images on the retina, the moving images on the retina, and the movement of the eyeball has been um, corollary discharge theory. And I think there's, a, oh, it's the, the discussion of that theory begins on your textbook in page 183. So let's go over that real quick. Correlation discharge theory uh, postulates that there's three separate signals that go um, into the brain to help us into a, um, um, a detector that helps us to uh, determine if there's movement. First, there's the image displacement signal. And this is a, the signal that's created as this image is stimulating receptors across the retina. So as the, as the receptors are being stimulated across the retina, this uh, signal gets sent out of the eyeball, uh, out of the eye, uh, to, to the brain. Right? So we have that, the image displacement signal saying, hey, there's uh, an image uh, moving across our retina. The other signal that we have is the motor signal. And this is the, this is the signal that is sent from mostly areas in your brain stem and midbrain uh, to your eye muscles. Um, uh, each one of your eyes has several muscles attached to it that move it um, to follow things. So this signal um, is, is, of course, used to control our eyes. But the most important thing about the corollary discharge theory is the third signal, and that is the corollary, corollary discharge signal. This is a, a signal that gets split out from the motor signal. So whenever your brain sends signals to um, your eyeball to move, that signal gets split and goes uh, to the same place that the image displacement signal goes. So what the what it, what's going to end up happening is that your your um, your your brain is going to be comparing uh, the image displacement signal with the corollary discharge signal to determine if something is moving. Now, how does that work? Well, the corollary discharge signal and the ir image displacement signal both go to what's referred to in the in this theory as a comparator that compares things right <laughs> it compares things so it's called the comparator and it takes the corollary discharge signal and the image displacement signal and it compares them to decide whether or not there's movement right so and here's how it works if it receives input from both the corollary discharge signal and the image displacement signal at the same time movement is not occurring okay so think about the situation where uh, think about this situation here again the third situation where Maria was sweeping her eyes from left to right looking at the scene okay in that situation she's moving her eyes around to look at the scene so the motor signals are being sent to the muscles of the eye and as a result, part of that motor signal is also going to the comparator, 
right? So you're so the comparator is getting input from the corollary discharge, and the image of the retina is the, the uh, retinal image is is moving as she sweeps her eye across the scene. So the image displacement signal is also being activated. So when the comparator sees the corollary discharge signal and the image displacement signal at the same time, what it does is it's, it sends a signal out that says, hey, there's no movement here. There's nothing, I'm not seeing anything move here, okay? However, and here this picture here is a pretty good um, uh, example of that. Uh, here's, here's another example. So let's say the eye is not moving, but it sees an object moving uh, across it, the uh, optic array. So it sees a local disturbance flowing across the optic array. In this case, that's a, a, that's a person. So the eye signal, and it sees uh, something moving across its optic array. This means that only the image displacement signal is going to the comparator. So the comparator says, oh, I see something there's something moving. There's something moving in my optic array. Similarly, when the, um, <clears throat> when the, uh, uh, the uh, um, eye is following somebody moving, notice that the corollary discharge signal, which is a split from the motor signal, right? So the eye's moving, so the, motor's, the motor signal's going to the eye. And of course, the motor signal is being split as the corollary discharge, so that's going to the comparator. But notice if the eye is following the person walking, that uh, th that person's image on the retina is not moving. It, the, the the retinal image is staying stationary, so there's no output from the image displacement signal. So the comparator gets one input from the corollary discharge, and it says, "Oh, I see something moving." Okay. So just remember uh, that if nothing goes to the comparator or if both signals go to the comparator from the image displacement and the corollary, no movement is detected. If either the image displacement signal goes to the uh, comparator or the uh, corollary discharge signal goes to the comparator, uh, then movement will uh, be detected. And this image here is a really good summary of that. Uh, the eye is not moving, but the stimulus is moving. So you're just getting the IDS signal and we say we perceive motion. If the eye is following the stimulus, that means the eye is moving, but the stimulus is being held in place by the movement of the eye. So there's no, there's no motion on the retina we get just the, uh, so we don't get the IDS, but we get the CDS, the corollary discharge signal, and we perceive motion. If both are firing at the same time, so if your eye is just sweeping across uh, the, the, uh, the optic array, the landscape, and the image on the retina is changing, and uh, the eye is moving, you're getting both the IDS and the CDS, that means um, there's no uh, there's no movement perceived in the optic in the in the in the field of vision that you're looking at.